So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome Lauren Templeton. Today. Thanks for having me come speak today. I'm very excited to join you here. I run a registered investment advisory firm located in Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, which is a satellite community um, in Chattanooga. And I'm focused exclusively on global value investing. So most people, when I come speak to them, want to know a little bit about my very famous great uncle, Sir John Templeton, who pioneered global value investing. Now, I know that a lot of you are younger and may not be very familiar with his career, so I thought we would um, hit some of the highlights. So Uncle John was born in 1912 in a tiny town in Tennessee called Winchester, Tennessee. It's where I grew up and it's where my parents still live to this day. He was the youngest of two sons and um, he left Winchester, Tennessee to attend Yale University. It was during the Great Depression. And during his time at Yale University, he received a letter from his father, my great-grandfather, saying that he could no longer afford college tuition, even to the tune of one more dollar. Uncle John often remarked to me that that was one of the best things that ever happened to him in his entire life. Instead, he went out and got several jobs and also started playing poker. And he was um, a very good student of probability. Um, but he graduated from Yale University in 1934 at the top of his class. He was president of Phi Beta Kappa, which is the, you know, the oldest and most well-known honor society in the United States. He was the recipient of the Rhodes Scholarship, and he went and attended Balliol College at Oxford, where he graduated with a degree in law in 1936. He left um, Oxford on a trip around the world with a friend. They visited 27 countries, and it was a trip that shaped his viewpoint for many years to come. He ended up at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, where he saw the building contingency of Nazi soldiers. Um, he was known as pioneering value investing and international investing. Money Magazine named him arguably the greatest stock picker of the 20th century. Uh, before he died, he gave most of his wealth to some foundations, the Templeton Foundations, which fund the world's largest cash prize. So the Templeton Foundation gives out the Templeton Prize once a year, and it always exceeds the Nobel Prize because he was, after all, an intensely competitive person. And he wanted it to always uh, be the world's largest cash prize. Um, lots of interesting people have won the Templeton Prize, and it's given out for progress in spirituality and religion. Now, I like to start all of my presentations with a few of his quotes, um, just to familiarize yourself with his investment strategy if you are not already familiar. The first is, a major cause of higher prices is higher prices. But when the trend is reversed, then lower prices lead to still lower prices. To buy when others are despondently selling and to sell when others are avidly buying requires the greatest fortitude and pays the greatest ultimate rewards. Bull markets are born on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy, and the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. An investor who has all the answers doesn't even understand the questions. If you want to have better performance than the crowd, you must do things differently from the crowd. And lastly, people are always asking me where the outlook is good, but that is the wrong question. The right question is where is the outlook most miserable? So, my uncle always had a desk plate in his office that simply read, trouble is opportunity. And we have had those replicated and have them in my office as well. It's a really good reminder of his investment philosophy. 
But today, I want you to all be global trouble hunters with me. And we are going to look at some historical points of trouble, and then also some trouble that might be brewing in the future. So this requires some imagination. I want you to imagine that you've worked really hard your entire life. You've been a saver. You've done all the right things, made those decisions, the hard decisions to save. And you've invested your capital in the market. This is the stock market crash of the Great Depression, where investors lost 87% in three years. This stock market crash almost took out the father of value investing, Benjamin Graham. Both Sir John and Warren Buffett are well-known students of Benjamin Graham, but it almost demolished even the father of value investing. Here's a graph of the 1970s bear market. This decline is only 48%. Would you be a buyer at the bottom? If you think so, remember that this stock market crash occurred with runaway inflation, skyrocketing, skyrocketing unemployment, oil embargoes, gas shortages, and rationing. What would have been your perspective at the bottom of this market? Would you be buying stocks? or would you be hiding under your desk? This next graph is a graph of Black Monday, which occurred in 1987. This is a well-known crash in the market. The, market, the Dow Jones lost 22% in one day. Now, I actually remember this crash. My dad was a stockbroker at <coughs> Dean Witter Reynolds, and I remember being in the living room at home with my mother. My dad came home from work and he asked her to step outside in the hall and he closed the door. And I imagine that he told her that they had lost probably 25% of their net worth that day. It was not a sad day in our home though. I just remember him doing that. Uncle John was well known on this day for saying this is going to make our returns for years to come. He was a buyer that day. Now, my husband did a recent revision of the book, The Templeton Touch. And when he was writing that book, we went and interviewed a lot of famous money managers that knew my uncle. And we interviewed one of his old employees um, named Marty Flanagan. Marty is now the CEO of Invesco. But Marty said, on the day of the crash in 1987, Uncle John got up, left the office to go walk in the surf for an hour. He did that every single day. A lot of value investors, as you know, Saurabh, have this built into their daily schedule, whether it's Monish's nap room or some type of physical activity. But he got up like it was no other day, and he left, and he went and walked in the surf. And when he came back to the office, he was greeted by a bunch of young analysts who said, Sir John, Sir John, don't you see what the market has done? How could you have left the office? And he said, boys, sit down. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we're in a bear market. The good news is it's almost over. Now, we've also interviewed a broker that had an open line to his office that day. And that broker tracked all the purchases in, his, in a ledger and calculated the return two years later. And Uncle John had made 200% on those investments that day. Now, if you had just held on to your um, investments, the Dow was back up. Um, to where it was before the crash two years later. If you had invested um, in an index tracking the Dow at the bottom, you would have had a 60% return off the bottom. So just something to remember during these events. This is the dot-com bubble crash um, where the market lost 50%. This is the S&P 500. The NASDAQ lost almost 80% during this crash. I also remember this one well. I was, I was working as a sales assistant at Morgan Stanley to two technical analysts. It's kind of the antithesis of all things Templeton. But I was there, and the wealth effect was in full view. I mean, there were steak dinners and champagne nights, and there was a new IPO every day. People were so excited. And I made the regrettable error of going down to the Lyford Key Club and meeting with my uncle and asking him, what tech stocks are you buying? Mm -hmm. And he just shook his head at me. And he said, you know, Lauren, when I was a child, 
I would walk from my house in Winchester, Tennessee to the town square, and my brother would go with me. And we would gather in the yard of a home, and lots of people would gather. And eventually, the owner would come out and flip a switch, and lights would come on and light up the house. And that was the spread of electricity. He said, now, I went back and calculated it, and the time to get out of those stocks was two years prior to that. And then he walked me through every bubble he had seen in his lifetime. And he told me on that day that he was shorting tech stocks, which took you know, a lot of courage during that market. Um, but he was using a strategy referred to as the IPO lockup strategy. So he knew that even the, the insiders of these companies knew their companies were overvalued and that they would take the first, the first chance they got to sell the shares. So he would short stock seven days prior to the IPO lockup expiration and cover about 10 days later. I never asked him how much money he had on during that trade, but we've heard he had 40, 400 million in short positions and that he made over 90% on many or most of those trades. So that was a really interesting time. And then, of course, you all remember the most recent financial crisis where we had almost a 57% market correction. Now, that was a great day for me. I um, actually was pregnant with my firstborn born child during that. And she was born on March 10th, 2009. The market lows were on March 9th, 2009. So I remember vividly buying stocks in the delivery room. And the nurse came in and told my husband to shut down the computer. And I looked at him and said, did you get the orders filled? Because we had been buying stocks for months prior to that event. And we knew that the markets were being really irrational with valuations. And we wanted to buy as much as we could. Now, market corrections um, and crashes are a staple to the market. They're going to happen. It's not if, it's when. So since 1900, there have been 125 corrections. Um, corrections are defined as a drawdown of 10% or more peak to trough. There have been 32 bear markets defined as a 20% drawdown or more peak to trough. Um, so you're going to spend about one third of your life in bear markets. Bear markets come along every three to three and a half years. Corrections come along every year. Really good investors have learned to harness those, the power of the bear market to boost their returns for years to come. That's really what distinguishes um, an, average, an inv average investor from a great investor. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term, homo economicus. But despite looking just a bit like my husband in college, it's actually an academic term used to define man as a perfectly rational wealth maximizer with the infinite capacity for rational decision making. I mean, do you think homo economicus exists? I don't. And despite that, homo economicus is used all the time in finance and economics. So most of Western philosophy and academia preaches Plato's mind-body split and the predominance of rational thinking. Students in business school are taught to calculate risk using standard deviation and beta. And homo economicus really supports this model. But value investors say, no, we don't buy that. You know, intrinsic value often differs from price. Risk is simply paying too much for a security. And really, the returns bear this out. The returns support a value investor's perspective. Here we have a graph showing the 20-year annualized returns by asset class. And as you can see, stocks had returned 9.9%, bonds 6.2%, Gold 5.8, oil 5.6, international stocks 5%, and homes 3.1%. The average investor, 
Now, how is that possible if all these asset classes outperform the average investor? It's because people are really terrible decision makers, and they're oftentimes buying high and selling low. Um, now, I'm a really good Southern girl, and I was raised on a diet of BLTs. But in my family, we called them Buffett, Lynch, and Templetons. These are three of the greatest investors, and they're track records, and they are remarkable. I think one thing to highlight is that Warren Buffett has an incredible um, vehicle for investing. Peter Lynch and Sir John both manage mutual funds. Mutual funds are terrible vehicles for the manager because people are always giving you money at the wrong time and taking it away, away at the wrong time. So they're very, very difficult to manage. And this is a really important point. So Peter Lynch, um, when he was annualizing 29%, conducted a study. And he wanted to know what the average investor in Magellan had earned. And what he found was that the average investor had earned 5% and many had actually lost money. He was annualizing 29%. So again, investors are constantly doing the wrong thing. When a manager runs up, they give them money. When the manager draws down, they take it away. And that's how the average investor earned 5% or lost money when the product they were investing in was annualizing 29%. Now, this is something I want you to remember. What is a really easy way you could have outperformed Buffett, Lynch, or Templeton sitting at home in your pajamas eating potato chips? Well, the way you could have done it is you would have simply added money every time they had drawn down. Arithmetically, you would have a higher return than these managers. So investing can be very complex but it can also be very simple. And I always tell our investors when they walk through the door, this is a partnership. I am a tool in your toolbox. But if you give me money after I've had a big run up and you take it away when I draw down, together we're gonna produce a really poor return. So the investor have, has some responsibility in this. If you're not good at controlling yourself, you should use a dollar cost averaging program or something like that to remove your emotions from that process. But I think that's really, really important to remember. So you can invest with the best manager in the world, but if you can't control yourself and you're constantly putting in money at the wrong time and taking it away at the wrong time, you're gonna have really poor returns. But there is a reason for your poor returns, and you all have an excuse for your lousy investment returns. That should make you feel pretty good. There's a biological reason for this. So researchers at the University of Pennsylvania has found, have found that the human retina can process 10 million bits of information per second. This is about the capacity of an ethernet connection. Your other senses add about a million more bits of information per second. So the total bandwidth of the human brain is about 11 million bits of information per second. But the human, only about 40 bits of information make it to the human conscious. So the way the brain works is it's typically taking this information in and processing it in a region known as the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is involved in decision making, um, complex cognitive behaviors, self-control, but it's very analytic and it's a very slow part of your brain. So when you think of the brain, you can think of the brain as sort of taking in information through a fire hydrant and the prefrontal cortex is like a slow leaky faucet dripping out. Now, when your eyes and ears sense danger, or if you turn on CNBC and the market's crashing and they've always got this fabulous music playing in the background to really heighten your anxiety, the problem is, is that your brain 
bypasses the prefrontal cortex and sends information to an area called the amygdala. And the amygdala controls your fight or flight response. And the amygdala is a much faster process, processes information much faster. And it, to do so, it relies on something called mental shortcuts or behavioral finance experts call this heuristics. And it's these mental shortcuts that oftentimes get investors into a lot of trouble when they're investing. So I think reading about behavioral finance is really fascinating, and there are a lot of books out there, and I would encourage you to pick one up and read about it, because once you're aware of these mental biases, you actually become a better investor. You know why you're reacting um, that way to really scary information. But some of the best examples, or my favorite examples, um, often occur in Vegas. So people have... Um, the tendency to segregate money based on use, even though all dollars are created equal. And they treat those dollars very differently. And there's also something called the found money effect. So I think the most interesting observation of this is in Vegas when an investor walks in and plops down $1,000. And let's say they do really well and they win $500. That investor will do totally different things with the money. So with the original $1,000 they come with, come, come with, they may pay their mortgage or their phone bill, but that 500, that found money effect, they may go buy a new expensive pocketbook or they go out to a fancy restaurant they normally wouldn't dine at. And that's why all these shops exist around Ve Vegas. And they've actually videotaped people in Vegas. And this effect is so strong that some people actually will put the money in separate pockets. So the money they came in goes in this pocket. The money they won goes in this pocket. The other really fascinating example of this in sort of the real world is the lottery. I was actually at my local Rotary Club one day, and somebody came in to speak to us about the Tennessee lottery and the history of it. And when they first started the lottery in Tennessee, it was not popular at all. They did not sell many tickets. And then somebody came up with the brilliant idea of letting people pick the numbers to go on their ticket. And sales exploded. It was the illusion of control. So had the probability increased that these individuals would win the lottery? No, not at all. But they felt like they had more control over it. And this happens in the market all the time. My dad has always told me, Lauren, don't confuse genius with a bull market. And that's a really good example of that, right? So whether it's day traders in the dot-com era or it's house flippers during the housing boom, there is a tendency to have this illusion of control, right? So. You make some money and you think, hey, I'm really smart. You know, I've, I've really got some control over the outcome of this next trade I'm going to put on. And you start to take on more and more risk. And that's how bubbles start to happen in the financial markets. Now, I know being this close to Stanford, you guys all know about the famous marshmallow test. I have seen other people come speak to you about the marshmallow test. I was looking at videos. But this really is um, an interesting experiment. So for those of you who don't know, the marshmallow test was a series of experiments run at Stanford University in the 1960s and 1970s. In the, during the marshmallow experiment, they would put one marshmallow down in front of a child. And they would say, you can eat this marshmallow now. or I'm going to leave the room, and when I come back, if the marshmallow is still here, I'll give you two marshmallows. Now, obviously, the child that was able to wait is better at delayed gratification. It also correlated with higher test scores and better achievement in life. Um, but what they found is that two-thirds of these kids could not de delay gratification and wait for the person to come back to get the two marshmallows. Um, and this is a really important point when it comes to investing. So human beings have a really different, difficult time controlling themselves. What this little boy is actually responding to is a hormone produced by the stomach called ghrelin. 
And it's one of the weaker hormones produced in the human body. And if two thirds of these kids couldn't resist that hormone, investors really have little shot at resisting these uh, stress hormones that the brain floods the body with during times of panic. So it's very difficult to buy at the bottom of the market. And you very well may be a genius. And you work here at Google, so I assume that most of you are. But if you're not good at controlling your emotions, you will never be a good investor. This next slide is really the hallmark of every value investor. I mean, this is it. This is value investing. Um, this is a slide that shows the present day value of the S&P 500 going back to 1860. The index didn't exist back then, but they've pieced together what it would be. And the red line shows the actual real stock price. So as you can see, the two, the two lines vary. And James Montier is the person that said stock times are 14 times, stock prices are 14 times more volatile than underlying fundamental than the underlying fundamentals of the business. This means that's either 14 times more than Maalox you're gonna eat on an annual basis because you're so upset, or 14 times more the opportunity that you're gonna have to distinguish your return pattern and to do things differently than the crowd have better results than the crowd. So this is really important. Now, so Rob said that you guys wouldn't mind a few family pictures and that I, I should feel free to bring them. So I'm gonna show just a few because it relates to Uncle John and how he developed this technique of buying at the bottom of the market. So this is my great-grandfather, Sir John's father. He was an entrepreneur, um, he was a lawyer, he sold insurance, he also owned cotton gins. Here's a picture of him standing in front of some cotton bales in Tennessee. But he had an office in Winchester, Tennessee. There it is on the second floor and it faced the town square. So during the Great Depression when farms would come up for auction, he would simply look out his window, here's the town square, he would look out his window and if the auction produced no bidders. He would walk down his stairs, go to the courthouse steps, and buy the farm for cents on the dollar. And it was th witnessing this over and over again as a young person that really made a big impact on Sir John's investment style and the way he um, learned to buy at the point of maximum pessimism. So really quickly, what does all that mean for today? How is this applicable to you in the current market? Well, here's just a really basic, very basic valuation slide. So how are things kind of looking? Well, the US looks a little, you know, barely valued to overvalued. Things are looking a little better in Europe, even cheaper in the emerging markets, but the, the worst risk-reward relationships are really in the fixed income market at this point. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of information on that. So currently right now in the United States, 11,000 people reach retirement age every day. And this will continue to occur for the next 10 to 15 years. A lot of these people have saved for retirement using something known as the 4% rule. The 4% rule simply states that you can withdraw 4% every year. You can inflation adjust that withdraw every year in a 60-40 bond portfolio, and that money should last you 30 years. So that's kind of been a rule of thumb for financial planners, and that's how people have saved for their retirement. The problem is that the real rate of return required for this relationship to hold true is 5.6%. So if you put an inflation expectation on that, um, you come up with something in the area of eight to eight and a half percent nominal returns required for the 4% rule to work. The problem is that the S&P 500 is currently yielding 5.6%. 10-year treasuries, 2.47%. 
You do a weighted average return of that as if you're running a 60-40 bond portfolio, and you come up with 3.4%. That's way short of the 8 and 8.5% 8 .5 rule, uh, return required for the 4% rule to work. So this is a problem. And investors are really faced with three different choices. So A, they can work longer. And we think that's about 9 to 10 years longer. They can um, spend less, save more. People aren't real good about that. Or they can somehow increase their investment returns. And we think this is what this population is really relying on. They're trying to increase their investment returns. So let's think about that. What are the ways you could increase your investment returns? Well, in a traditional world, or if you're thinking about a 60-40 portfolio, which I know no one runs anymore, but for um, simplification purposes, we're going to talk about a 60-40 portfolio, you could increase your equity allocation. So is that a good idea now in the market when valuations aren't really screaming the buy signal? This is an equation known as the Gordon Growth Model. And it looks really complex, but what I want you to know is you can take the current P 18.5 for the S&P 500, and you can plug it into this equation. And you can come up with what, what the growth forecast is. So here, the G comes out to be 5.03%, and that's growth in earnings, OK? Is that realistic, or is it not? Well, here's some data to help you decide. Since 1979, um, annualized EPS growth has been 5.5% since 2000, 4.6%, last in the last five years, 2.7%. In 2015, it was 0.2% X energy. So at our company, we think, yeah, this is, this is a little bit unrealistic to think that um, growth in earnings is going to be 5.03%. Um, so we're thinking that, you know, at, equities are overvalued to fair, fairly valued right now. And if you're a retiree, um, this might not be a good time to increase your equity allocation. So what else could you do? Well, you can increase the yield in your bond portfolio. And we think this is really what investors have been focused on, which um, ties back into the awful risk reward um, that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation. Here's just a graph that shows the recent 50 and 100 year bond issues, OK? And fixed income, there are two ways to increase your yield. You can go out in maturity, or you can take on credit risk. That's it. So and we think that people have been doing both. So here's a really good example that people have been going out in maturity to increase yield. One of the problems with that is simply the duration on these instruments. So right now, a 30-year US Treasury has a duration of about 18 and a half years. If you don't know what duration is, it means that for a 100 basis point move in interest rates, you're going to have a decline in the price of the bond of 18.5%. OK, we've had about a 100% move from the mid-2016 lows in interest rates. So I think there is, you know, especially with retirees, I think there's this um, idea that you can't lose money in fixed income. And, and you can't if you hold the maturity to, um, if you hold the bond to maturity. Um, but a lot of these people are invested in bond funds and bond ETFs, and they're really surprised when they're opening up their statements and they're, and they're seeing this. Um, you can lose purchasing power, by the way, but um, the other thing you can do is take on more credit risk. And here is a graph of high yield credit spreads, which are really close to a historic low again. I mean, I think we hit the historic low in the past 20 years in 2014. But right now, high yield credit spreads are 3.45. I think the historic average is like 5.47 or something like that. So investors are clearly taking on more credit risk to increase yield. If you want to um, Google a really interesting example of investors taking on just, I think, unbelievable credit risk, Google pick 
toggle bond. It's a PIK toggle bond. And if you're not familiar with this instrument, it's a, it's a bond issue that allows the issuer um, the ability to pay the creditor back in um, more bonds if it can't afford the cash coupon. So it's basically an admission when they um, issue the bond that oh, we're not so credit worthy and we might not be able to pay you back, but if we can't, we'll just pay back with more debt. And people have been buying this. I mean, if you look at the issuance of PIC toggle bonds, they have exploded since the financial crisis. Why would anybody buy these instruments? But they do. And so that shows you that investors are truly reaching for marshmallows right now. Um, there's a really well-known retailer. Um, I won't tell you who it is because you can figure it out, but they're owned by a private equity firm. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, they issued a $500 million pick toggle bond issuance. They immediately issued themselves a special dividend to get paid. And then in 2015, they uh, activated the toggle and the bond started trading at 30 cents on the dollar. So another thing to remember about the current market environment that we're in right now is everybody thinks, oh, corporations are so much healthier than they were pre-crisis. Wrong. Corporate debt is, up, is back up to pre-crisis levels. And the sad thing is this debt has not been used to finance growth in many cases. It's been used to repurchase shares. It's been used to issue special dividends. Um, so we think that investors are reaching for marshmallows in the bond market. We think the companies are reach, reaching for marshmallows. And I guess my parting piece of advice to you would be simply this. Uncle John was once asked if he could name one word, one piece of advice for investors in one word, what would that be? And he simply said, patience. Now, if you are honest with yourself and you know you're not a patient person, and you were totally that kid, because I know you all live in this area, that, <laughs> that participated in the marshmallow experiment, and you ate the marshmallow, and you just don't want to admit it today, um, you, can, you can do this. This is my favorite picture of my uncle ever. And it's a picture of him reading the Wall Street Journal at the North Pole. So I one time asked him about his experience managing money in the Bahamas. And he said, you know, my returns got a lot better when I moved here. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Why do, you, why do you think that is? And he said, well, you know, I think it's because I get the Wall Street Journal a few days later than everybody else. So when you think about that, the tendency to herd and social proofing is so powerful in the financial markets that investors can often benefit by simply removing themselves from the herd. The best investors in the world aren't usually in the financial centers like New York and London. I mean, Warren Buffett's in Omaha, Nebraska. Sir John managed money over a grocery store in the Bahamas. They have removed themselves from the herd. And so if you have trouble controlling yourself, um, turn off C CNBC. Don't look at your um, stocks every day. And, and just remove yourself from the herd. And with that... Thank you. That's it. So thank you once again. Uh, yes. Fantastic. So it was really nice to learn about Sir John's uh, personal side, as well as uh, how you mentioned the importance of biases and the role that our mind plays. Uh, you mentioned uh, Monisha's nap room. Uh, Ray Dalio has talked about meditation. So I was curious, do you have uh, any personal habits or routines that you personally use uh, it might also be interesting to just hear about what your average day looks like for somebody who's, who doesn't really know you that well. Right. Well, I work out daily. Um, it's, I feel like I have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I either play tennis or I go running or lift weights or something like that. Um, but I think there are a lot of strategies you can use um, to, to kind of control stress and focus as an investor. And one of the things that we do, just from an investment perspective, is that we keep a list of securities in our drawer that these are stocks that we want to own that currently aren't priced the way we want them to be. They're not value stocks. What's some names on the list? No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, during a market correction, we pull that list out. 
and we go to work. And there's a really um, palpable psychological shift when you do that. Because I do think that even the most seasoned investors can get nervous during a market correction or a market panic. But something happens psychologically when you shift your focus to the possibilities and you pull the list out. This is a list you've created when you were very calm and you're thinking rationally, and you pull the list out and you start entering buy orders. Something shifts, and um, it's really powerful, and I would encourage you all to keep a short list of securities in your desk drawer, and during the next correction or panic, use that to um, put in your buy orders. You also mentioned your time in, uh, I think, 2001 as a sell-side analyst when Sir John was shorting tech stocks. Mm -hmm. um, just curious, since you're in the Silicon Valley here now, what do you think of the tech industry now? Is it, uh, do you see the same sort of bubble-like behavior that you did that time? Well, I kind of anticipated this question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so a lot of investors are, are talking about the hefty valuations mm. um, out in Silicon Valley right now. And I think, for me, I'm more focused on um, the private equity world and the valuations in, in that world are really amazing, what people are paying for companies. And the markdowns that have occurred in private equity portfolios um, this year have been extreme in many cases. So we oftentimes don't invest in tech stocks. When we do, it's generally because we've purchased them during a market correction. Um, it's hard for a value investor to buy tech. We do own Google shares, though, um, and a few others. We own Alibaba as well. Um, so we, we buy a few tech names here and there, but it's usually during um, a market correction. Uh, you said mutual funds are terrible vehicles for investing, and you were... For the manager. Yes. And you're also talking about how the average investor uh, in a mutual fund actually earned much less, even when the manager did very well. Mm -hmm. So even from the investor's perspective, I find it curious, and yet you yourself run a mutual fund. No, I do not run a mutual fund. A hedge fund. Right. Hedge do, funds do you think separately the, managed accounts. Sure. So, I think um, what I was referencing in my presentation is that a mutual fund is a really horrible thing for the investment manager, okay? Because people can add money that they, they're constantly buying in when, let's say you're a value manager and people are buying in, so now you have more money to invest in an overvalued market. You know it's an overvalued market. And also, mutual funds usually have like a 5 to 10% max cash cap. So even if you're a value investor, investors are you know, pouring in more and more money because the market's hot. And you know it's almost impossible to find a value stock, but you have a 10% max cash you know, cap on that. And you're having to put money to work at a time when you don't even think it's a good time to put money to work. And then the market corrects and everything's on sale and you want to go out and buy everything. And guess what? Investors are taking money away from you. So you may be even faced with um, having to sell securities in your portfolio at the bottom of the market. So investors force this activity. So even in, amongst money managers who run separately managed accounts or you know, similar structures, you know, the same dynamic of investors exists. Uh, do you have... Do you have any thoughts on what might be a better vehicle, maybe permanent capital like you referred to Warren Buffett? You know, what are your thoughts on that, just more broadly speaking? Right. Well, investing in a vehicle like Berkshire Hathaway or um, something that doesn't, and mutual funds have distributions every year. Mm. So really, that's the, the gift the US government has given you, right, is that you can put your capital into a vehicle like Berkshire Hathaway, and it just continues to compound, and you don't pay tax on it until you sell it. So I think holding companies are really interesting to look at. Um, we have a large investment in a company in Canada called Fairfax, um, but Fairfax does pay a dividend. So you know those are great investment vehicles as well. But mutual funds are fine for that for anyone. You know, even really experienced investors, they are good investment vehicles. They're just difficult to manage. Great, and just a couple more. Um, you mentioned how you know this 
you know, when things are down, when there's maximum pessimism, that's where you want to look. And there's this idea of, you know, buying bargains, you know, that was popularized, goes back to Ben Graham, um, you know, buying stocks cheap. And when you read Warren Buffett's letters and his interviews, he also credits Charlie Munger with, you know, opening his eyes to another way of, you know, quality-based investing. Mm -hmm. And as a student of physics, you know, I've learned that, you know, there's, of course, action is equal to reaction. So it, I kind of mentally relate it to mean reversion, things that go up, mm -hmm. you know, come down and so on. But also there's this law of inertia, you know, that I relate to quality businesses. And maybe my mental model has flaws, but I'm just trying to explain my question better here. If you have a quality business with a moat and runway, um, investing in that, in that versus investing in cheap bargains, do you see these two differently or do you think uh, they could be both part of an investor's toolkit? I think it, they can both be part of an investor's toolkit. It's fine to pay, for, pay more for a quality company and they certainly deserve a spot in your portfolio. We have 10 core positions that we would consider high quality companies that we've mm -hmm. paid a little bit more for and they stay in our portfolio and then we reserve sort of the rest of the slots in the portfolio for positions that fall into this maximum pessimism type of um, theme. So they're either neglected stocks that aren't very well followed by Wall Street or there are opportunities that we have found at points of maximum pessimism. So Great, makes sense. And one final question, you know, talking of biases behavior, the manic depressive nature of Mr. Market, you know, what I took away from that is that being a successful investor takes a lot of self-awareness and self-introspection to begin with, I guess. Uh, so if I were to flip that and ask you, what do you think are some of your weaknesses as an investor? Oh, that's a dirty question. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't um, expect this one. <laughs> I, I do think you're right. Um, really good investors are really honest with themselves. Um, I think you have to know know yourself really well to be a good investor. I would say if I had um, my weakness might be on the on the sell discipline. So. Um, I've, I've set, used this phrase before, and my husband said, don't ever say that in front of anybody again. That's really horrible. <laughs> but I'll tell it to you today. I'm a greedy investor. So when, when I buy a stock and it turns out to be successful, you know, I also um, you have the illusion of control and think I'm a genius and have a tendency to maybe want to revise our models a bit and, oh, we could hold it <laughs> for a bit longer, even though you know, it's blown through our approximation of an in intrinsic value. So I would say that's probably where where I fall more. Where Appreciate I have problems. the candor. So everyone in this room and the tens of thousands of you who will watch this on YouTube, don't tell anyone else, okay? <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my husband I said it. Great. Uh, so any final questions in the room uh, for Lauren? Right. And Lauren, if you could repeat the question. Um, how do um, I make a sell decision? So our sell discipline is, is well-defined, uh, probably to compensate for my weakness that we just, just discussed. But when we purchase a stock, we've already um, calculated our approximation of intrinsic value. And actually, before we purchase a stock, our caveat is that we have to see 50% upside to our approximation of intrinsic value. So what we do is a series of valuation screens to drill down into the bottom decile of the market. And then we're generally running a discounted cash flow model on the company. It depends on the industry. Um, you know, if it's a financial stock, maybe a dividend discount model or something like that. But generally, we're doing a DCF. So we we know we have this range where we're you know we think this is the fair value of the company. And um, as the stock starts to approach that price, we start looking for replacements. Now, how it works in the company is that we have this massive spreadsheet with all of our positions on it. And we're constantly monitoring it to see, you know, what's in 10% to fair value, what's at fair value, what's gone through fair value. Can we find a replacement? What does that look like? Um, and like right now, we're sitting on between, you know, depending on the portfolio, 15 to 25% cash. That is all organic. That is not a decision that we made and said, hey, we want to target 20% cash. 
but it happens organically in the portfolio because as things start to hit fair value, we liquidate them, we need to find a replacement, but in a um, fairly valued or overvalued market, finding a replacement becomes much more timely. I mean, it's, it takes more time, it's harder to find. It may take you know a month, month and a half to find a replacement. Yeah. Several questions. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the question was in regards to core positions in the portfolio and portfolio turnover, and if core positions shouldn't remain longer, and you give them a little more leash to run. Um, yes, that's that's what we do. And larger sizes get, I guess, also no, in terms of allocation. Just, just yeah, we have a maximum six percent allocation now. Okay. Just to be specific. To oh, our our core portfolio is smaller than fifty percent. I think you've totally hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is a conversation that we have very frequently in our house. So um, what he's talking about is one time I, I was in the Bahamas and I was visiting with my uncle and he said, I don't even remember what we were looking at, to, to be honest, but he said, South Korea or something, I don't some country or something. And he said, I want you to, here's the investment universe. I want you to um, go fly back to Atlanta, come back and visit with me in a month. And I want every you know, company in this country and I want it ranked by PE ratio. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm just going to get my computer and we'll do it right now. <laughs> and then there it was because we just downloaded all the information from Bloomberg and it was available immediately ranked by P ratio or any other ratio he wanted to see. I mean, it all was instantaneous. Um, and he was amazed by it because when he was managing money, I think a lot of people think he was a great macro investor, but he really wasn't. He was using, I mean, he might have been, but that was not his technique. He was using um, value line to rank stocks by hand using valuation metrics. So, you know, it really blew his mind that I could download information on any, com any company in the world at the snap of my fingers, and I could look at it nine ways to Sunday and make decisions. I do think that edge is gone. You know, and this industry is so highly competitive. So the edge now is psychological. Mm. Um, I do. We have that conversation all the time in our house, but it usually goes more like this. Gosh, if we could have been managing money back when he was, that would have been amazing. Now, I don't know that we would have, you know, done all of the work that he did. Um, he believed that his edge was in something called the doctrine of the extra ounce, which we talk about a lot in my family. So you just do a little more work than your peers, just a little more work. And that's, those are the most successful people in the world. It's the doctrine of the extra ounce of work that you put in, the extra report, the extra meeting you take, the extra book you read. Um, that, that's kind of how he looked at it. So Lauren, can you elaborate a little bit more on the psychological edge? Um, Explain to us what, what do you think that is and, and how can an investor better develop it? Well, I think people can develop it. You know, your brain is constantly uh, sort of remolding itself in a process called plasticity. Um, but you can train yourself to be a good investor. What you have to do is put capital to work during these moments of panic and crises and reap the benefits of that. And then, you know, your brain learns, oh, it's like Pavlov's dog, right? There's a reward at the other end. Oh, I'm starting to look forward to the next event. And now not only do we look forward to corrections and crashes in our mm. office, I mean, we're kind of, we're past that. We, we want them to come. Mm. And now we're trying to um, anticipate where they might come, which is um, why I focus so much of the slides at the end of the presentation on the fixed income market, because we really think that there is trouble brewing in the fixed income market, and we're laser focused on finding opportunities. So if that unwinds the way we think it will, that we'll capitalize on that. Great. Fantastic. So thank you so much thank for you. the amazing talk and for answering our questions. Thanks.